Michael M. Hotep, founder of the African History Network, host of the African History Network show. I'm a talk show host, researcher, lecture writer, and historian. It is Thursday, March 26, 2020, and we are live. So everybody share this broadcast on your social media pages, social media platforms. So if you've seen the uh, news, you've seen the articles that I've posted, we saw that the U.S. Senate um, early Thursday morning, shortly before 2 a.m., passed a historic $2 trillion coronavirus uh, economic stimulus bill, okay? So I want to do an update on that and deal with what's actually in the bill and how will this help African-Americans and how much will you get, okay? Uh, we know that they're going to, uh, the bill includes direct payments to individuals and families um, of up to uh, $1,200 uh, in a check. Single people making up to $75,000 are expected to receive $1,200. Couples making up to $150,000 will get $2,400 and they have uh, additional money for each additional child that you have, right? Um, there, was, there was a lot of wrangling, a lot of negotiations between uh, Senator Mitch McConnell, Senate Majority Leader, Republican from Kentucky, Senate Minority Leader Chuck Schumer, Democrat from New York. They were working with Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin. All right, so uh, we're going to get in, we'll, uh, we'll get into this. And then if you saw the broadcast that I did on the 24th, I talked about provisions that the Congressional Black Caucus were fighting for to get in this bill. All right. Now, the bill still has to pass the House of Representatives. It's expected to go uh, to the House, is expected to pass the House on Friday, okay, Friday, March 27th. Okay, so uh, let's jump into this here. Um, and I'll give you the names, of, I'll give you the links to some of these articles as well, so you can go research this. Uh, African-American business owners, post the name of your business here on the thread of the broadcast. We'll let you know how you can advertise with the African History Network. Uh, email us at customer service at africanhistorynetwork.com, customer service at africanhistorynetwork.com. Then uh, also, if you'd like this type of information, you can donate to the African History Network, dollar sign, the AHN show through Cash App, dollar sign, the AHN show through Cash App. And then also through PayPal, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show. All right, well, after days of debate over how much money would go to uh, would go to people and debates over um, if we give direct cash payments to people who are unemployed, is that giving them an incentive not to work? These are some of the arguments that Senator Lindsey Graham and, and uh, uh, others were making. The U.S. Senate shortly before 2 a.m. Um, on the, the morning of March 26. 2020, uh, Thursday, unanimously passed a landmark $2 trillion spending package to fund hospitals and states' efforts to fight coronavirus and to counter the economic impact of the disease, okay? We know that the job numbers are going to come out. They're going to be horrible. Uh, we know that you've had a number of states that have to shut down all non-essential businesses, including the state of Michigan, where I am. I'm in Detroit. Okay. This has been devastating for businesses in general, but especially African-American businesses. Now, the bill also includes direct payments to individuals and uh, families. Single people making up to $75,000 are expected to receive $1,200. Uh, couples making up to $150,000, $150,000 would get $2,400, and families would receive an additional $500 per child. The bill would no longer include a provision that would have excluded lower income Americans from receiving the full benefit, okay? Democrats, even though they make up a minority in the U.S. Senate, they fought hard to get a lot of provisions in the bill that would benefit everyday people. This is much different than the bill that Mitch McConnell and the Republicans were proposing. That bill largely benefited corporations. Now, people who filed their taxes and used direct deposit 
can have the money sent directly to their bank accounts within a few weeks. This is what um, Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin said. But those whose account information is not already on file, who don't have bank accounts, or who don't file or who did not file taxes last year, face a longer wait for checks. All right. So we're going to see how this plays out. The bill is almost 900 pages. It still has to pass the House of Representatives. Um, Nancy Pelosi is encouraging members of the House, especially Democrats in the House, to uh, uh, pass the bill. And let's see here. Let's go to. So she's, she's encouraging them to pass the bill. All right. Let's look at um, I'm going to look at a few articles here. I want to look at this one here from the Washington Post. What's in the two trillion dollar coronavirus Senate stimulus package? So, uh, and I'll give you the links to these articles also. And then um, NBCNews.com is a good article dealing with what's in the stimulus package as well. So this bill aimed primarily at addressing the economic calamity that's unfolding because of shutdowns intended to slow the spread of the coronavirus outbreak with analysts making dire predictions about soaring unemployment claims and economic contraction. The legislation takes a, a, it takes a multi-pronged approach to confronting the mounting crisis. It contains, it contains a number of measures aimed at directly helping workers, including stimulus checks for millions of Americans. So uh, approximately 150 million American households will receive these stimulus checks. Um, it also, it, and other, so it, it includes stimulus checks for millions of Americans and others to shore up the government safety net with provisions such as more food stamp spending and more robust unemployment insurance benefits. There's also um, a lot of money in here for small businesses uh, as well to support small businesses. Now, it, the bill also includes numerous provisions to help businesses weather the impending crunch, providing them with zero interest loans, tax breaks, and other subsidies. So the bill uh, also includes some measures aimed at the public health care crisis, the public health crisis. It provides at least $100 billion for American hospitals to uh, help them survive what is expected to be an overwhelming influx of patients. So we already see like uh, here in, in the uh, Metro Detroit area, we already see some hospitals who they're basically at capacity when it comes to their ICU beds. And this is what um, flatten the curve is all about. We know a lot, we know that hundreds of thousands and is estimated possibly millions of people would get coronavirus here in the US. One estimate uh, from a um, doctor for the US Congress, one estimate is that between 70 million to 150 million worst case scenario would get it and up to 2 million people and up to 2 million people dying from it. Just, that's just here in the US, okay? If certain uh, provisions uh, are not put in place, if certain provisions are not put in place. All right, so here's uh, so let's look at an overview of what's in this Senate bill. Now, this passed the U.S. Senate 96 to 96 to zero. We know some U.S. senators are are out uh, because they either have the coronavirus, like Senator Rand Paul of Kentucky, or they are in quarantine. Okay, but it passed uh, 96 to zero. So we look at the $1,200 checks for millions of Americans. Okay. And how's everybody doing? Everybody share this broadcast. Um, is everybody doing on uh, Facebook and YouTube? Uh, and let me check. Uh, are we coming through okay? Let me know. All right. So $1,200 checks for millions of Americans. So the U.S. Senate package would send direct checks to tens of millions of families uh, to stimulate the economy. It's basically about 150 million American households. Uh, according to the reporting from the Washington Post, uh, a plan pushed by uh, Donald Trump and Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin to help families deal with the economic shock of the virus. The legislation will give taxpayers $1,200 per adult and $500 per child. The benefit 
uh, would be smaller for individual taxpayers earning over $75,000 annually or $150,000 for a couple filing jointly. And the benefit would disappear altogether for individuals earning over $90,000 uh, a year, okay? So if you uh, annually make $75,000 or less, okay, you'll get $1,200 per adult, okay, in general and $500 per child. So the U.S. Senate also scrapped a provision in the initial GOP legislation, what, the, what Republicans were pushing, that would have offered smaller checks to the poorest families after it was heavily criticized by lawmakers of both parties. So eligibility for the benefit, for the, for the $1,200 uh, checks, eligibility for the benefit will, deter will be determined by a taxpayer's 2019 or 2018 tax returns. Critics have said tying eligibility to last year's tax returns could mean the benefit fails to reach those hit by the current downturn. Critics also have raised concerns that it would be difficult for the poor and homeless to receive the benefit. And the broadcast I did on uh, the 24th, and when I dealt with what the Congressional Black Caucus was pushing to have in this bill, and they released a 10 page document dealing with provisions they want in, the, in that bill that would greatly benefit the African American community. Um, some of those things are in this bill. Now it's gonna be interesting to see what happens when it goes to the US House of Representatives. The House of Representatives is on recess right now. Um, uh, it, it, it would be interesting to see what the debate is in the House of Representatives. Um, now. Senator Mitch McConnell has dismissed the U.S. Senate until something like April 10th, okay? Because you have uh, some that are already quarantined um, because they, they were exposed to somebody who has the coronavirus or yes, my like Rand Paul who's been diagnosed with it. So Senator Mitch McConnell has already dismissed the Senate. All right, that's something else to keep in mind. Uh, check out this article from news1.com from March 23rd, 2020. Congressional Black Caucus coronavirus stimulus proposals protect those who are most at risk. Most at risk. Congressional Black Caucus coronavirus stimulus proposals protect those who are most at risk. And the other one from uh, blackamericaweb.com, the CDC urges Democrats to create coronavirus package for Black Americans. This is from March 23rd, 2020 from blackamericaweb.com. The CBC urges Democrats to create coronavirus package for Black Americans. Okay, so I'll talk a um, little bit about what's in that one. And I did an extensive broadcast March 24th that went deep into that. So check that out also. It's on our Facebook fan page, the African History Network, and it's uh, on our YouTube channel also, uh, Michael M. Hotel. So check, uh, check that out as well. Okay. So... Um, Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin said on, set on, said on Wednesday, March 25th, he wants the money to be sent in the next few weeks and it will arrive via direct deposit or mail based on 2019 or 2018 tax return information. Former IRS officials have said the timeline is aggressive. So that's what he wants to do. Um, we'll see what actually happens. If this is anything like the testing, everybody who wants a test gets a test. Is it, if this is anything like the testing fiasco and there's still not enough tests, uh, there's, still not, not, there's still not enough coronavirus tests for one, uh, even though there are more tests um, that have reached the health facilities today than say two weeks ago, that is, that is true, but there's still not enough tests. But, it, but it's interesting how celebrities can get tests it's interesting how people who know Trump and people in Congress can get tests. But you have numerous cases of doctors who have patients who have symptoms of coronavirus and they can't get tests. The other problem is that a lot of these tests are taking four or five days to come back with the results. Okay, that's another big problem. And in some cases, people are dying in while they wait on the test results to come back or don't know what to do while they wait on the test results to come back. All right. 
So let's continue here. Uh, okay, so Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi uh, on, on this past Monday unveiled a more aggressive version of the plan pushing for checks of $1,500 per adult and $1,500 per child with a cap of $7,500 per family. Okay, so well, from 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 what I'm from what I'm hearing and what I'm reading, it looks like Nancy Pelosi is just going to go ahead and push the bill that came from the Senate as is in the House of Representatives without any changes. But we'll see what the uh, Democratic Caucus does. So we, we don't exactly know what's going to happen there. Okay, so when we look at uh, this two hundred and ninety billion dollars allocated to increase uh, an increase in unemployment insurance benefits. Uh, the Senate package would also dramatically beef up unemployment insurance benefits to protect workers from massive expected, expected job losses in the coming weeks, okay? Because you're gonna have millions of people uh, filing for unemployment. You're gonna have millions of people filing for unemployment the unemployment numbers, uh, the new unemployment numbers are about to come out. They're about to, is going to skyrocket. Okay, it's going to skyrocket. And actually, let me do a refresh. Yeah, the numbers are out now. A record 3.3 million Americans filed for unemployment benefits uh, last week as the economy faces unprecedented blow from coronavirus. Okay, because I knew the numbers were about to come out. They come out at 8:30 a.m. Um, usually the first Friday of each month, but they're coming out now. So I'll pull that up. We'll talk about that a little bit. Um, if you've been watching my broadcast, you know there were warning signs all along the way, going back January and February, those in the intelligence community, people like Secretary of Health and Human Services, Director Alex Azar in January, there were warning signs along the way trying to warn Trump about this. He ignored them. He disbanded pandemic teams, global pandemic teams. Uh, uh, John Bolton, his national security advisor in May of 2018, fired Rear Admiral Timothy Zimmer, who headed up the National Security Council's global pandemic team. Then he fired Tom Bossert, who was the Homeland Security Director. In October 2019, the PREDICT pandemic team, PREDICT, which was used by George W. Bush and President Barack Obama, that was disbanded under the Trump administration. Its job was to go in other countries and monitor these viruses and look out for what the next, next pandemic is going to be so, so, we, so the U.S. can minimize the effect of it. That was disbanded. All, all, almost all of this, if not all of this, was avoidable. But this is what happens when you have incompetent leadership in the White House and you have somebody who's declared war on scientists for the last three years. OK, um, so just to give you some. Just to give you some sources to document what I'm talking about. Because you may not be familiar with this, I don't know. Uh, let's see here. Because I have a lot of information here dealing with uh, coronavirus. I think I put it in the other stack. Just some, just some articles that came out recently here that dealt with this. March 20th, 2020. Washington Post, U.S. intelligence reports from January and February warned about a likely pandemic. March 20th, 2020, Washington Post, U.S. intelligence reports from January and February warned about a likely pandemic attack. From uh, New York Times, March 19th, 2020, before virus outbreak, a cascade of warnings went unheeded. Before virus outbreak, a cascade of warnings went unheeded. Government exercises, including one in 2019, made clear that the U.S. was not ready for a pandemic like the coronavirus, but little was done. 
This is what happens when you have incompetent leadership in the White House. Then, give you the last one, because there's a ton of information I have on this. See, I've been studying this in January, then going into February. So while a lot of people were talking about Oprah Gale, Snoop Dogg, Jada Pink Smith, this is what I was studying. Obama officials walked Trump age through global pandemic exercise in 2017. This is from, I think this was March 17, 2020. Obama officials walked Trump age through global pandemic exercise in 2017. This is from the heal.com, the heal.com. If you, um, I'll post the links to these articles here so you can check this out. If you've been watching my broadcast, you know I've been dealing with this type of information. Okay. Um, a record 3.3 million Americans' fathers reporting from the Washington Post. Because um, I read Washington Post, New York Times, NBC News, there's about 35 different news sources I monitor on a daily basis. A record 3.3 million Americans filed for unemployment benefits as the coronavirus slams economy. So this is just came out March 26, 2020, 8.30 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, this was reported by the Labor Department. Um, record 3.3 million Americans applied for unemployment benefits last week as restaurants, hotels, barbershops, gyms, and more shut down in a nationwide effort to slow the spread of the deadly coronavirus. Laid off workers say there was such a crush of people applying for jobless benefits at, at once that they waited hours on the phone and the websites in several states, including the state of New York and Oregon crashed. So it was uh, maybe about a week or so ago, I dealt with uh, the reporting from politico.com that dealt with uh, what was taking place with the filing for unemployment and the crushing number of people who were, um, the crushing number of people who were being unemployed, laid off, things like that. Okay, I'll try to find that article. We'll post that link here also. Many economists say uh, the coronavirus recession has already commenced and what happened last week is only the beginning of a massive spike in unemployment that could result in over 40 million Americans losing their jobs by April. We know also that African Americans are going to be hardest hit uh, by these job losses. Okay, so it was about a week or so ago, I did a broadcast dealing with this, um, how this is impacting African Americans. And uh, yahoonews.com had a really good article. Black Enterprise also had one. Coronavirus to impact low wage black workers the most. Coronavirus to impact low wage black workers the most. This is from um, finance.yahoo.com, finance.yahoo.com for March 12th, 2020. Now only one in third, so uh, uh, with a lot of states, a lot of cities, a lot of companies, uh, they're encouraging people to work from home, uh, telework. We used to call this telecommuting, like in the 2010s and the 2000s, we called it telecommuting. But only one third of the workforce can work from home. What about the two thirds that can't work from home? Only 31% of workers with salaries in the bottom 10% have paid sick leave. Only 31% of workers with salaries in the bottom 10% have, pay, have paid sick leave. 92% of high wage earners receive paid sick time, paid sick leave. 92% of high wage earners receive paid sick leave. Only 48% of workers in the leisure, hospitality industries have access to paid sick leave, okay? So there, there are a lot of African-Americans who work in jobs where they can't work from home. And according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, black and Hispanic workers are more than twice as likely to earn poverty level wages compared to their white counterparts. Roughly 8% of African American and Hispanic workers earn wages below the poverty level compared to just 4% of white workers. Women of color struggle in particular. 10% of African American women and 9% of Hispanic women are classified as the working poor compared to 3.5% of white men. Okay, check out this, check out this article. This, this, this one goes deep into it. 
That's one of the most extensive I've seen other articles dealing with that fast company, Black Enterprise. The one from uh, news.yahoo.com was um, one of the most uh, extensive articles. Okay. All right. Let's see. How you doing, Michelle? Uh, Self-employed will be taken care of too. Yeah, hopefully so. That include me. You know, being self-employed ain't it, sometimes not as glamorous as it appears on TV, on the television. Uh, let's see here. Okay, let's go back to this. So Bank of America predicted 3 million people would apply for unemployment benefits last week, easily surpassing the prior record of 695,000 new job claims that was set in 1982 as the nation battled high inflation. But even Wall Street's expectations uh, but even Wall Street's expectations were too low for how much the coronavirus is slamming the economy. Okay, wait till the next job report comes out. It's going to be, it's going to be horrific. All right, so we'll post the link here for this article. You can read the rest of it. This is from Washington Post. A record 3.3 million Americans filed for unemployment benefits as the coronavirus uh, slams economy. And let me just do a quick... Uh, search here I wanted I want to see if they talk about uh, African American unemployment in this one news one.com will probably have some information in the next day or so that deals with African American unemployment I just want to see okay so we'll see how the stock market reacts to this to this news All right, so let's go back to what's in the um, $2 trillion uh, economic stimulus package, coronavirus uh, stimulus bill. And how's everybody doing on uh, YouTube, okay? We've got Eric, Journal of Jade News, T. Good Dukes, Robin D, D.B. Cooper, King of Enigma, Calvin, uh, just a few people watching this on uh, my YouTube channel, Michael M. Hotep, I-M-H-O-T-E-P. All right, so we have an increase in unemployment insurance benefits. You see why you need it. You got 3.3 million people who filed, and that was just last week. The Senate package would also dramatically beef up unemployment insurance benefits to protect workers from massive expected job losses in the coming weeks. Um, currently, unemployment insurance pays an average benefit of $300 a week, about a third of the typical wage in the United States, about a third of the typical wage in the United States. That, uh, that benefit is partially paid by employers who are required to kick in money to the unemployment insurance system. It can take weeks for people who fail, it can take weeks for people who fall into unemployment to have their claim processed by state governments, all right? So state governments are overtaxed in processing this. Also, what happens when the state employees, what happens when the people who process all this, when some of them get sick with coronavirus? We're already seeing postal workers get sick with coronavirus, okay? So uh, the other thing is some states have not declared a shut down or uh, stay in or how you, however you want to phrase it and shut down non-essential businesses. Some states have not done that. They're probably going to have to do that also. A lot of these are Republican, a lot of these states, uh, uh, states that have Republican governors, okay, like Florida, dumbass Ron DeSantis in Florida. What happens when they start having to shut down businesses? You're going to see the unemployment rate skyrocket. And it's also expected that this is not going to be the only economic stimulus bill for dealing with the coronavirus. It's expected they're going to have to do another one. So currently, unemployment insurance pays an average benefit of $300 a week, about a third of the typical wage in the United States. The benefit is partially paid by employers who are required to kick in money. Uh, to the uh, unemployment insurance. It can take weeks for people who fall into unemployment to have their claims processed by state governments. Uh, okay, so the Senate 
plan, the US, the, the plan that the Senate passed overhauls the existing system. The proposal extends unemployment benefits to people who may not have been fired, but are unable to work as a result of coronavirus because they are sick, quarantine, quarantined, or need to take care of a child forced to stay home from school. This is another big thing, okay? Um, parents who have to stay home because their child is out of school now because the K through 12 schools have been shut down, all right, in various states. And right now you have parents all across the country who realize how valuable teachers are. They may not have realized it before now, but now they have to be with their child five days a week and they can't go to work. They realize how valuable teachers are. The other thing is, is a lot of parents who realize their teacher was correct, the teachers were correct when they told them how bad their children were. There's a lot of parents right now realize the teachers were correct when the teachers told them how bad their children were because they got to, they had to deal with them uh, five days a week. Okay, I'm just saying, it may not be your child, but you probably know a whole bunch of people who are talking about how bad their children are. Okay, you know, I don't mean criminal, you know, I'm just mean, you know, issues with behavior. I don't mean bad, I don't mean evil children. You know that, <laughs> but <laughs> I don't. I, I, maybe, maybe they are like baby's kids. We don't die, we multiply. I don't know, but there's a lot of parents right now that realize, oh my God, the teacher was correct when they said how bad my child was. You know, so. <laughs> All right. All right. How you doing, Eddie? And Cadell, how y'all doing on uh, Facebook? Okay, let's continue here. Everybody share this broadcast on your social media platforms. Invite your friends to tune in also. All right, we're dealing with, for those just tuning in, we're dealing with what's in the $2 trillion uh, coronavirus economic stimulus package that passed the U.S. Senate, okay? Then it has to go to the House of Representatives to be signed, to be passed, debated, signed in the, uh, to be debated, passed, it's expected to be passed on Friday, then it goes to Donald Trump to be signed in the law. So under the U.S. Senate bill, the federal government will provide an additional $600 on top of existing unemployment benefits, which are currently an average of $300 for four months, currently an average of $300 for four months. A handful of Senate Republicans argued on Wednesday, like, Senator Lindsey Graham, Senator Ben Sass, Senator Lindsey Graham of South Carolina, Senator Ben Sass of Nebraska, Senator Tim Scott of South Carolina. Senator Tim Scott is a black Republican. You would think he would like want this for black people, but at the same time, he said he wouldn't go vote for reparations either. So I guess maybe not. So a handful of Senate Republicans argue, argued Wednesday that the expansion would hurt the economy by making the unemployment insurance benefit larger than the minimum wage. They were arguing, well, hey, people can just get unemployment. It's, they can make more money getting unemployment than working, even though a lot of businesses have been shut down and they can't work. The new benefits would be covered by the federal government as, employ as employers are expected to get hammered and may lose the capacity to fund unemployment benefits. Yeah, yeah, because a lot of businesses had to shut down and they don't, and they don't have revenue. And they, and they had debt. They had cr lines of credit that had to be paid back. They had loans that had to be paid back. A previously passed coronavirus package gave states $1 billion in additional funding to prepare their unemployment programs for the expected onslaught over the coming weeks, okay? Because this is the third coronavirus bill. The first one was $8.3 billion. The second one was $100 billion. If you're watching my show, my Sunday night show, the African History Network show, I've been talking about this in my broadcast throughout the week. This is the third, this is the largest, this is, the, this is a record bill. This is a huge stimulus package bill, $2 trillion. So Next, we look at aid for large businesses, aid for large businesses new, with new oversight measures, okay? One of, the, uh, one of the most controversial provisions in the package is a provision 
for hundreds of billions of dollars in loans for large businesses getting hit hard by the outbreak. So in, in, in industries, the airline industry wants a bailout, the cruise line industry wants a bailout, okay? Now, some people argue, well, wait a second, you got the $1.4 trillion tax cut that you didn't need, Donald Trump's $1.4 trillion tax cut for the top 10%, especially the top 1%. A lot of these corporations took, this, took the money that they saved and did stock buybacks and rich CEOs, okay, increased the value for shareholders. And then some of these corporations did that. And on top of that, they, they, add, they put in more robotics and automation in their facilities, which eliminated jobs from employees. So you have a lot of critics who are saying, well, wait a second, bail your own self out. You got billions, you got Sheldon Adelson, who is a, um, he not only owns a newspaper, he's not only a huge, uh, he's a billionaire, he's a, uh, a, a huge backer of Donald Trump, but he's a hotel magnate. It's like the, a lot of people are saying, let the billionaires bail themselves out. They can go to the banks and get loans, get loans for whatever they need. Let the, let the billionaires bail build, build themselves out. This is what some critics are saying. So the plan includes aid for severely distressed industries, consistently consisting primarily of loans and loan guarantees allocated by the Treasury Department and the Federal Reserve. The funding initially consisted primarily of loans but was later expanded to also include direct grants for the airlines, okay? Now, there's, there are more restrictions. This, this version of the Senate bill, there are more restrictions. Democrats fought to have more restrictions put on the money that, that is going to uh, the industries, going to the corporations, because they said there have to be stipulations in, in, in the bill that you cannot use this money to buy back stocks, okay? And you have to maintain employees you can't take this take this loan and then lay off employees and also there's a provision that that prohibits donald trump owned properties and, and his hotels and things like this from benefiting from this as well which is good which which is good we'll get to that in just a minute here um so the money includes 25 billion dollars in grants for the passenger airline $25 billion in loans for the passenger airlines, $17 billion for companies deemed critical to national security. Okay, so you got $50 billion for the airlines, $25 billion in grants for the airlines, $25 billion in loans for the airlines, $17 billion for companies deemed critical, critical to national security, and $425 billion for other businesses, for other businesses, cities, and states allocated through funding mechanisms set up by the Federal Reserve. The 17 billion for the firms essential to national security was written largely to benefit the aerospace manufacturer Boeing, okay? But Boeing, Boeing is having a, a huge problem because of their, because of their planes crashing. The, the main problem Boeing is having is not tied to coronavirus. The main problem they're having is uh, tied to plane crashes, but it's seventeen billion dollars for firms. Uh, there's um, seventeen billion dollars for firms essential to national security, and it was written largely to benefit the aerospace manufacturer Boeing, because there were lobbyists who were pushing for the industries and the airline industries and the cruise line industries and things like this, right? But this bill here is much better for everyday people than the original bill that Moscow, Mitch McConnell and, and Senate Republicans were pushing. Now, Democrats initially balked at giving the administration, the Trump administration, wide latitude over the program with some liberal critics calling it a, a corporate slush fund, a corporate slush fund, while administration officials argued the money is needed to shore up companies forced to shutter through no fault of their own. So some people made the argument, and this is partly a, a valid argument. Um, the, the airline industries, the airline industries employ millions of people. If they go under, these people are going to be without a job. So the argument is to save the airline industries. And so you can save those jobs that, that people have. Okay. But you have to have restrictions 
on the money that you give to the airline industry. Same thing with the cruise lines industries. They, they employ uh, tens of thousands of people, hundreds of thousands of people, I don't know the exact number, for the cruise line industry. But you got you have to have restrictions on that money that's being uh, loaned to them. So the, the legislation does not include restrictions on salary increases for executives or firms receiving bailout money, as well as a prohibition on issuing stock buybacks that primarily benefit company uh, shareholders. Okay, now that would that may be a sticking point in the House of Representatives. Originally, this was a point of contention. Um, the legislation, I'm sorry, let me back up. The legislation does include restrictions on salary increases for executives of firms receiving bailout money. So it does include that. That's what I thought. As well as it includes a prohibition on issuing stock buybacks that primarily benefit company shareholders. Okay, so yeah, that's what, that's what I originally thought it was and it, it does it does include uh, those restrictions. That, that, was one of the, that was one of the big points of contention and why a lot of people were calling this a corporate slush fund. Because it's like, wait a second, we didn't learn anything from the bank bailouts in 2008. You got to have restrictions on this money. Now, those provisions last only a limited time. Those provisions last only a limited time. The White House agreed toward the end of negotiations to include new oversight measures for the fund, including a congressional oversight panel and a new inspector general to probe the decisions made by the U.S. Treasury, as well as pro, uh, prohibitions on the funding benefit, uh, on, as well as prohibitions on the funding benefiting the President Donald Trump, Vice President Mike Pence, cabinet members, or congressional lawmakers. The prohibition also applies to uh, these federal officials' relatives as well. So what it's saying is, we just saw, you know, I just reported uh, last week on Senator Richard Burr of uh, Democrat from North Carolina. Senator Kelly Loeffler, Democrat from, I mean, I'm sorry, Republican from North Carolina. Senator Kelly Loeffler, Republican from California. Senator Dianne Feinstein, uh, Democrat from California. And it was one other one who sold stocks right before the market crash. And, and the worst case was Senator Richard Burr because he's the chair of the Senate Intelligence Committee. And he's downplaying, he was downplaying the severity of coronavirus in public. But in, on February 27th, in a, in a private, at a private luncheon at, at the Tar Heel Club, he warned the people who were there and the, the membership at the Tar Heel Club was between like $500 and $10,000, something like that. He warned the people there that the coronavirus was going to be really bad. It was going to be a pandemic and it's going to be something on the level of the 1918 Spanish flu pandemic. And that killed 675,000 people in the US. It killed 50 million people worldwide. He warned them that it was going to be something along those lines. And then two weeks before that, February 13th of 2020, he made 33 stock trades. All of them were sales. Okay. Um, you go watch my broadcast while I broke this down. This was a few days ago. I dealt with this. But I'll give you these articles. You can uh, read this here because I don't have time to get deep into it. But uh, National Public Radio and ProPublica broke this story because National Public Radio got the a, a, a copy of the audio recording of him addressing the people who were at the luncheon at the Tar Heel Club, warning them about how bad coronavirus is going to be. While in public, he was downplaying the severity of it. Um, this is from March 19th, 2020, NPR.org, National Public Radio. Weeks before virus panic, weeks before virus panic, virus panic, intelligence chairman privately raised alarm, sold stocks. Weeks before virus panic, intelligence chairman privately raised alarm, sold stocks. Okay, this is about Senator Richard Burr, uh, Republican from North Carolina. And then ProPublica had the, uh, ProPublica had a big article, ProPublica.org, 
this dealt with him selling up to 1.7 trillion in uh stocks let's see which one is this one here okay that's washington post senator richard burr head of powerful committee sold large amounts of stocks before sharp declines in the market that's the reporting from the washington post this is ProPublica. ProPublica broke a portion of this story they had a big article dealing with this as well senator dumped up to 1.7 million dollars a stock after reassuring public about coronavirus preparedness. This is from March 19th, 2020 also, ProPublica.org. Senator dumped up to $1.7 million of stock after reassuring public about coronavirus preparedness. Uh-huh. So he, he's called for a um, ethics investigation. Okay, a lot of people are calling for him to resign. Okay, so uh, we'll see what happens with that. All right, everybody share this uh, broadcast on your social media platforms. How's everybody doing? Um, so it's going to be interesting to see how soon uh, these checks are going to go out, these $1,200 checks to individuals, and then they get an additional uh, $500 for children. It's going to be interesting to see uh, how soon these uh, payments are going to go out. Um, how easy will it be for small businesses to get the small business loans, to show up their business, make payroll, things like that. These are, these are, these are the details. The devil's in the details. Okay, these are the details um, that really make or break a bill, how good it is. Okay, so $425 billion for other businesses, including small businesses, cities, and states allocated through funding mechanisms set up by the Federal Reserve. Now, Democrats initially balked at giving the administration wide latitude over the program with some liberal uh, critics calling it a corporate slush fund while administration officials argue the money is needed to shore up companies forced to shutter through no fault of their own. Okay, especially they're largely talking about corporations, large corporations. Um, okay, the $425 billion fund, the $425 billion fund will also go through the Federal Reserve's lending facilities, a system that was activated during the 2009, to, activated during the 2000, the year 2000 to 2009 financial crisis, which would limit Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin's ability to control the funding, said Ernie Tedeschi, a former Obama administration economist. The criteria for assessing that fund must be broad-based, quote unquote, broad-based, broad, broad-based, and cannot benefit any one company, Tedeschi said. Because much of these long, because much of these are loans, the ultimate cost of this part of the stimulus may end up to be less, okay? Because they pay back the loan, all right? And with, with for small businesses, I'm not, I don't remember whether it's interest-free, okay? But being that they pay back the loan, then it reduces the overall cost in the long run, in the long run, um, all right. So we're looking at, I'm looking at the total cost of these different sections here. So the cost of the $1,200 checks and $500 for children is estimated to be $290 billion. The cost of the increase in unemployment insurance benefits is expected to be $260 billion. The aid to large businesses, new oversight measures, uh, et cetera, and then A to uh, the smaller businesses, uh, the, the, the A to large businesses, et cetera. That's expected to be $504 billion. Next, we have emergency aid for small businesses, emergency aid for small businesses. The bill also aims to help small companies weather the economic storm. It does so through generous zero interest loans for firms with fewer than 500 employees, firms with fewer than 500 employees, zero interest loans that could be forgiven if the firm's 
follow certain conditions such as not firing their workers, okay? So the bill also aims to help small companies weather the economic storm. It does so through generous zero interest loans for companies with fewer than 500 employees. And these loans could be forgiven if the firms follow certain conditions such as firing their workers. So this portion of the bill was because different senators wrote different portions of the bill. This portion of the bill was written by Senator Marco Rubio, Republican from Florida, with significant input from congressional Democrats. The package includes close to $400 billion in loans made available through lenders certified by the Small Business Administration, such as banks and credit unions. The maximum loan is capped at $10 million. The maximum loan is capped at $10 million. So, um, for for African American, I, I have to find out about this, and I probably need to reach out to Ron Busby at the um, U.S. Black Chamber of Commerce. I want to find out. There are four million African American-owned businesses now. There's only about a hundred thousand or so that have employees. So I want to find out if it's, even if it's like an LLC, but if it's just the owner, do they qualify for this or do you have to have employees to be able to qualify for this? Or like, I, I, I want to get more, um, I want to get more details on this. Now the loans convert to grants. The loans convert to grants if used for covering employee salaries, rent, paid leave, utility payments, health insurance premiums, or other necessities or worker protections. Okay, the loans convert to grants if you if the owner uses the loans for covering employee salaries, rent, paid leave, utility payments, health insurance premiums, or other necessities or worker protections. Okay, so if you so a lot of African American owned businesses we have home a home business like myself. It's online, but they have a home business also. So if you have a 16 year old child, I wonder, could you then put your, could you put your 16 year old child on, on your payroll starting like uh, today? So now you have one employee, so now you qualify. So now you, so now you got an employee. So now can you qualify for some of these loans or is it, uh, or you see, the, the, I, I need, wanna get more details on this. If you have to have employees to qualify for this, can you uh, put your put your uh, sixteen year old on the <laughs> on your payroll? Okay, pay him hundred dollars a week, whatever it is. All right, <laughs> that's a good question. I need to I need to find out the answer to this. All right, so the leg um, so the legislation includes guardrails aimed at preventing business owners from pocketing the money that's being lent. Loans given to firms with tipped employees, so like, like bars and restaurants, tipped employees, could be forgiven if they are used, if the loans are used to provide additional wages to their employees. Nonprofit organizations can also apply for these funds, okay? Uh, because, now this bill, okay, this bill is almost 900 pages. So we really have to see what the restrictions are, what the stipulations are, all right? How, how does this apply to nonprofit organizations? If it's a, a business, how many employees do you have to have? What's the minimum number of, of employees? Can it just be the owner? Like if it's an LLC, can it just be the owner like a lot of African-American owned businesses are? So there the are other details we need to get for this. So the total cost of that is $377 billion going to small businesses. The total of small businesses with um, less than 500 employees, firms with less than 500 employees, okay? That aid is $377 billion. Now, business tax cut deferrals. The law also includes numerous changes to the taxes paid by firms that are aimed at giving them an additional buffer against likely economic headwinds, although, uh, 
these cuts were met uh, by, uh, by, liberal by liberal skeptics. The Republican tax law of 2017 limited to 30% the amount uh, companies could deduct off their interest. The Republican tax law of 2017 limited to 30% the, amount, the uh, amount firms could deduct off their interest. In a move to improve business liquidity, the coronavirus package increases that number to 50%, okay? Increases the number to 50%, the amount that firms could deduct off their interest. It also gives firms greater ability to deduct losses against taxable income, which proponents say will primarily help unprofitable firms weather the storm, okay? So the package also delays the payroll taxes typically paid by employers on wages, a cut intended to help firms survive a liquidity crunch. All right, so that portion of the bill is $280 billion, dealing with business tax cuts, deferrals, $280 billion. Hospitals, there's $180 billion in aid for hospitals. Hospitals expanded healthcare spending. So this is huge because healthcare workers, the doctors, our, our nurses, healthcare practitioners, they're on the front line. In a lot of these hospitals, there's a lack of uh, personal protective equipment, lack of, uh, of um, masks. Uh, there's a lack of uh, there's a lack of a protective gear. Okay, uh, that they're suffering from. There's also a lack of ventilators. There's a lack of ventilators as well. Uh, Governor Andrew Cuomo has been talking about this. Governor Gretchen Whitmer here in the state of Michigan has been talking about this. She was just on MSNBC, The Last Word with Lawrence O'Donnell Wednesday night, uh, Wednesday, March 25th. Uh, Governor J.B. Pritzker of the state of Illinois has been talking about the lack of ventilators. And the governors are having to bid, they're having to compete to get these ventilators with countries like China and Italy who are buying up all the ventilators, all right? And they're not getting a lot of help from the federal government. They're not getting a lot of help from, from the federal government. Um, federal government just uh, released, uh, from my understanding, they're, they're gonna release 4,000 ventilators to the state of uh, New York, but Governor Cuomo said he needs 30,000 ventilators. At first, they were just sending 400. Okay, he said he needs 30,000 ventilators for the ICU units in um, uh, for the intensive care units in the state of New York. So hospitals expanded health care. Okay, the legislation also include, includes hundreds of billions of dollars in funding to help prepare America's health care infrastructure for the coronavirus. The centerpiece of that section of the bill, a key ask of Senate Democrats. This is something Senate Democrats are really pushing for. A key, uh, the centerpiece of this of this section of the bill is a one hundred billion dollar fund for hospitals and providers hit hardest by the outbreak. A hundred billion dollar fund for hospitals and providers hardest hit by the outbreak. That money can be used for protective gear for healthcare workers testing supplies and emergency operations centers, among other necessities. The provision was written amid bleak outlooks at many hospitals, particularly in rural America, that fear they will be overrun by a massive influx of patients, okay? And the whole, um, the whole initiative behind flatten the curve is by not reaching a tipping point in various states so that the hospitals are overran with sick people who, uh, have, to, who, who have to be put in, in intensive care units. Because they're only a certain, like the state of New York, they only have 3,500 ICU beds. And then this is where the ventilators are going to be. You need people like uh, and then you're going to need healthcare professionals to tend to these people who are who are in the intensive care units. Well, you have more and more doctors and 
nurses who are getting sick with coronavirus, they have to go into quarantine. And even if you don't have it, if you work with somebody who's been diagnosed with it, usually you're gonna be quarantined also for 14 days. A lot of this has to do with the lack of protective, uh, personal protective equipment. And then when you have a depletion in the numbers of doctors and, and nurses who can tend to these sick people, okay, now, you, you, now you're gonna have a huge problem on your hands. Here in Detroit, here in the Detroit area, Beaumont Hospital, Henry Ford Health, Henry Ford Health Systems, it was just reported yesterday, they're basically at capacity for their, uh, their, ICU, uh, their, their, their ICU beds. They're basically at capacity. And we haven't even reached the worst, we haven't even reached the peak of the uh, diagnosis here in the state of Michigan for coronavirus. So uh, the legislation also increases funding for community health centers, Medicare payments, telehealth and home service and public health agencies such as the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, okay? Because we know funding for the CDC um, over the course of a few years, we know funding was cut. We know that a lot of doc uh, there were a lot of scientists that were let go of from the CDC. Now, what's interesting, they talk about um, rural hospitals, okay? Hospitals in rural America. The provision was written amid bleak outlooks at many hospitals, particularly in rural America. It's interesting that they mention rural America. The reason why that's interesting is because one in eight Trump voters live in counties that have no ICU beds. One in eight Trump voters live in counties that have no ICU beds because it's government that determines largely which cities have hospitals, which cities have hospitals with ICU beds, which counties, et cetera. Okay, that's government that largely determines that. So you're gonna have a lot of, you're gonna have a lot of, especially older people who get sick, who supported Donald Trump and they live in counties that don't have ICU beds. Okay, so that provision was put in the bill. Washington Post had an article dealing with this. And uh, let me see here, I'll try to pull that up. Just a second, just give me a minute here. Let me try to pull that article up. I talked about it on my uh, Sunday night show. All right, how's everybody doing? Everybody share this broadcast on your social media platforms, invite your friends to tune in. Is everybody doing on Facebook and YouTube? Um, African American business owners, email us at customer service at africanhistorynetwork.com, customer service at africanhistorynetwork.com. We'll let you know how you can advertise with the African History Network. Our current promotion, buy one month, get two months free. We have that going on for a few more days. We just brought on some new advertisers. Um, buy one month, get two months free. Also, if you like this type of information, you can donate to the African History Network, dollar sign, the AHN show, dollar sign, the AHN show through Cash App, or paypal.me, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show through um, PayPal, okay? And then also at our website, africanhistorynetwork.com, africanhistorynetwork.com. Click on the um, yellow donate button right on the home page. All right, and let me try to monitor this because computer's running slowly. All right, so let's continue here. Then uh, be sure and follow us on our YouTube channel, uh, Michael M. Hotep, I-M-H-O-T-E-P, and my Facebook fan page, the African History Network. Turn on notifications so you know when we go live also. All right, so for hospitals, expanded healthcare spending, that's uh, $60 billion. I mean, that's, 100, that's $180 billion. For emergency aid for state and local governments, emergency aid for state and local governments. So a lot of, a lot of 
uh, the governors in different states, maybe your governor has been calling for this, Governor Whitmer of the state of Michigan, uh, Governor Cuomo, state of New York. States are, are expected to be hammered by the economic crunch, both with rising costs as people seek additional public assistance and lower tax revenue because of um, falling business activity. The federal aid package provides $150 billion to state and local governments, $150 billion to state and local governments, including $8 billion for tribal governments. That's, so that basically refers to Native Americans. $8 billion for tribal governments is included in that $150 billion to state and local governments. Each state will receive a minimum of $1.5 billion. Each state will receive a minimum of $1.5 billion. Experts say Washington DC received a disproportionately small amount of money based on its population because it was grouped uh, for funding with US territories. The package also includes $25 billion in infrastructure grants for states around the country. Okay, now one of the, uh, let me go quickly here to this uh, article from blackamericaweb.com. If you saw my broadcast that I did on the 24th, March 24th, okay? And the broadcast on March 24th dealt with the Congressional Black Caucus was urging uh, Democrats to create a coronavirus package for African-Americans. And the Congressional Black Caucus put out a 10 page document that listed the provisions that they wanted. Some of those provisions were already in the version of the Senate bill that was being pushed by Democrats. Um, but there were some things in there that weren't. OK, so it's going to be interesting to see how this matches up. But if we look at the article from uh, BlackAmericaWeb.com, um, BlackAmericaWeb.com, and how you doing, Sharice, Kenneth, uh, Stanley, uh, Keith, on um, Keith Williams on uh, Facebook. The CBC urges Democrats to create coronavirus package for Black Americans. Okay, this is from BlackAmericaWeb.com, March twenty third, twenty twenty. Some of the highlights of what they were asking for to be in the bill: provide support for working families by providing all workers with access to paid sick days, paid family and medical leave, so those who are sick or need to take care of a loved one can do so without fear of losing their job or paychecks. Require a 90-day moratorium on all consumer small business credit payments, student loans, credit cards, mortgages, car notes, small business loans, personal loans, which would enable Americans experiencing uh, hardship to weather the crisis by suspending debt payments for the duration of this pandemic at a time, at a time when many Americans are confined to their homes and unable to work to bring in income. Provide a nationwide moratorium on utility shutoffs, a nationwide moratorium on utility shutoffs. Uh, provide $1 billion in support for Head Start. Provide, provide $4 billion in childcare funding to reduce the strain on families. Grant debt cancellation and immediate relief for millions of people already crushed by record levels of student loan debt, which would help stimulate the economy when we need it the most provide $4 billion in second chance grants, $4 billion in second chance grants with priority given to community-based nonprofit organizations to ensure individuals released from custody have the resources needed to uh, successfully reintegrate into their communities, matriculate back into society. Release all juveniles who have committed a nonviolent crime, release all juveniles who have committed a nonviolent crime. Because as we're seeing, like at Rikers Island in New York, and we're seeing um, there's been a big concern from a lot of civil rights organizations, National Action Network, National Action Network, NAACP, uh, Color of Change, Black Lives Matter, et cetera, about what happens to the incarcerated population. What happens to the incarcerated population? Because if it can spread quickly through a nursing home, then also it can spread quickly through prisons, okay? 
Uh, and then we deal with juvenile, we deal with juveniles who are incarcerated. So release all juveniles who have committed a nonviolent crime. Ensure all incarcerated individuals and staff are tested for coronavirus, including everyone in custody, those going into custody and those who are scheduled for immediate release. Prioritize releasing incarcerated individuals in prisons, jails, and detention centers through clemency, commutations, and compassionate release. Okay, so we'll post a link here. Uh, to that article from blackamericaweb.com. That's the CBC urges Democrats to create coronavirus package for black Americans. That's on March 23rd, 2020. At the bottom of the article is the link to the 10 page document with all the provisions that the Congressional Black Caucus uh, has been pushing for. All right, so let's continue here. Um, So 180 billion, uh, so, um, so emergency aid for state and local governments, that's 175 billion, okay? Other items in the package include 45 billion for the Federal Emergency Management Agency's FEMA Disaster Relief Fund, 45 billion for the uh, FEMA Disaster Relief Fund, $31 billion to support local schools and colleges, $31 billion to support local schools and colleges, $25 billion for the nation's transit system, and $25 billion for more food stamp funding, okay? So that gives a, a synopsis of what's in this $2 trillion bill. You're gonna hear more about it. This still has to be passed by the House of Representatives. It's, it's expected to be passed by the House of Representatives um, Friday morning, uh, the see, Senate, uh, let's see, House Majority Leader Steny Hoyer is calling for a meeting at 9 a.m. Uh, let's see here. Let me look at the reporting from the Washington Post here. The bill would extend. Uh, he's calling for a meeting at 9 a.m. so they can take a vote on this uh, Friday morning. So we'll see how this turns out. Uh, then also NBCnews.com has um, an article, what's in the uh, $2 trillion coronavirus bill? What's in the $2 trillion coronavirus bill? Okay, we'll post that link also. You can check that out um, as well. And then there will be, I'll, I'll, I'll do some follow-ups dealing with this when we get more details because this is a uh, an almost 900 page bill when we get more details especially how this will impact african americans as well um small business support so roughly um companies with fewer than 500 employees could be eligible for up to 10 million dollars in for forgivable loans okay we talked about that assistance to corporations uh public health student loans the bill would allow students to defer loan payments for six months and keep their Pell Grants. Any interest that accrued during that time would be waived. Students who have to leave school because of the coronavirus would not lose their eligibility for future Pell Grants. And the bill would, would allow them to keep any unspent money from Pell Grants or loans, okay? Uh, because HBCUs are hit hard by uh, this coronavirus and, and, and students have to leave school, students have to leave the dorms. Another thing is some of these students in, in colleges in general, but especially some of the HBCUs, some of these students, they may not have anywhere else to go once they get put out the dorm. They may not have anywhere else to go. All right, let's look at some of your comments here. Okay, Kenneth said, thanks for the bill, Brown. Hospital capacity reached and majority Detroit hasn't even tested yet. Yeah, that's true. And, and, and the state of Michigan has not reached its peak in, in, in coronavirus diagnosis either. The state of Michigan has not reached its peak either, okay? 
So this is hitting uh, uh, Michigan has the fifth largest number of, of coronavirus cases in the country, the state of Michigan. Okay, Cherie Stanley. Uh, let's go back in here. All right, African American business owners, post the name of your business here on the thread of the broadcast. And then email us at customer service at African History Network.com, customer service at African History Network.com. Uh, we'll let you know how you can advertise with the African History Network. Now, a lot of people um, are still looking for shoes. You may uh, have wide feet and it may be hard to find your size. Well, the wide shoe outlet can help you. They, uh, they have a brick and mortar store, but they're also um, have a uh, e-commerce store. Visit their website, simplywide.com, simplywide.com. Uh, you can give them a call also 301-702-1401, 301-702-1401. They have men and, and women's sizes uh, up to 15 double E. They carry brands like Naturalizer, Soft Spots, Ross Homerson, Pro Pet, uh, Pro Pet Walking, a uh, Pro Pet, um, Easy Street, and more. They have a brick and mortar store in uh, Marlow Heights, Maryland, at 4279 Branch Avenue, 4279 Branch Avenue in Marlow Heights, Maryland. But visit their website simplywide.com, simplywide.com for the uh, wide shoe outlet. Now, a lot of people are looking for something to read um, while they're at home, either working from home because of coronavirus, their children are out of school, et cetera. Black Heroes of Fire, Black Heroes of Fire is a book by the Cobb Walcott Jr. And this deals with the history and the heroism of the African American of the African American firefighters who were members of Chicago's Engine 21. Chicago's Engine 21. Black Heroes of Fire: The History of the First African American Fire Company in Chicago by the Cobb Walk Walcott Jr. Black Heroes of Fire introduces and describes the background of the members of Engine 21, Chicago's first organized paid African-American firefighting company. Find out about their exploits and their heroism. You can order this book from amazon.com or at the website blackheroesoffire.com, blackheroesoffire.com. Now, some people want to get in shape right now. A lot of people are at home. They want to work out at home or they still go out for a walk, even, even here in the state of Michigan. Even though there's a, uh, a shutdown, you can still go out for a walk. You can still go out to some parks, things like this. She ran herself fit.com can help you with this. Now, the father of She Ran Herself Fit, her name is Felicia. Felicia lost over 200 pounds by changing her diet and running. Now, running may not be your motivation, but you have to find what drives you. She Ran Herself Fit's mission is to inspire and motivate women to make healthy lifestyle changes. She Ran Herself Fit is a brand that promotes living healthy lifestyles by making small sacrifices in your daily routine and changing your diet you can combat many of the different diseases that are prevalent in the african-american community at the website she ran herself fit.com they have workout apparel that you can purchase and you can also see before and after pictures of felicia who lost over 200 pounds so visit their website she ran herself fit.com she ran herself fit.com all right, Eric said, okay, that's business in my county, Prince George's County, the richest African-American county in the country. So what now, what happened in Prince George's County, Eric? Did the, uh, the businesses have to uh, shut down? Reggie, I've turned in, tuned in kind of late, is the Green New Deal in it like the Republicans say. So here's what happened, Eric. Um, this Senate Democrats, push to have certain things put in the bill. I haven't seen the Green New Deal in this bill. This bill still has to go to the House of Representatives to be debated and voted on and passed. This, so this just passed the U.S. Senate, okay? Passed 96 to zero in the U.S. Senate. It still has to go 
to the House of Representatives. Now, Nancy Pelosi is pushing for House members to go ahead and vote for this bill on, on Friday, to vote for this bill and go ahead and pass it, all right? So I don't know what's going to happen with that. Um, this is a almost 900 page bill. I've seen a synopsis. I haven't seen anything really necessarily about the Green New Deal in it. Um, we see things dealing with infrastructure. Uh, we, we see allocations for infrastructure, um, et cetera. So that portion, I don't, I, I, I'm not sure about. Um, we have to get more details on this, okay? But that's a good question. On YouTube, we have, because uh, my computer froze up on me, so I'm uh, my second computer. So I'm looking at my phone here. We've got William on YouTube. I want to try to get to some of your questions here on YouTube, okay? Uh, let's scroll back here. So just give me a second here. Uh, I'm on my YouTube channel, Michael M. Hotep. Let's see. We've got William Cup the fourth. I'm from Detroit, too. Okay, William, D.B. Cooper. Good morning, uh, Brother Michael. How you doing, D.B. Cooper? I'm going to try to get through all these comments. Uh, King of Enigma, do you think the stock market is going to go down again? So the uh, uh, this, it, if you tuned in late, I talked about the unemployment numbers just came out. 3.3 million people filed for unemployment last week. Uh, Washington Post is reporting on, uh, reporting on this, has the reporting on this. Uh, so that is probably going to impact the stock market. That was more than expected. It was a Bank of America predicted that it would be 3 million people that apply. Um, so it's going to, it, it, it's, um, you're going to still have some bad days at the stock market. I'm telling you right now, you still, have, you, you probably still have, you still have some bad days. Um, a lot of this depends upon what Trump does. The past couple of days, the coronavirus task force briefing has taken place after the stock market closed. Stock market closes at 4.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. That may be strategic because if you go back to Friday, March 20th, when the stock market dropped, the Dow Jones Industrial Average dropped 955 points. The press conference took place while the stock market was open. The more Donald Trump talked, the more the stock market dropped. The more he talked, the more the stock market dropped. That was Friday, March 20th. So this week, a lot of the press conferences have taken place after the market closed. That could be strategic. So that what he says doesn't have an immediate effect on the, at least the US markets. If he says something that's stupid, White House officials can come out and correct what he says before the market opens at uh, 9.30 uh, a.m. the next morning. So that could be strategic. But the 3.3 uh, million in uh, unemployment, and, and then this is going to be the next month's unemployment is going to be even worse because you're going to have, you have some states, because what happened was there, there was a lack of leadership coming from the White House on actually what to do with this, okay? I mean, I mean, remember just a few weeks ago, he was saying, uh, Trump was saying that uh, it's only 15 people who've been diagnosed with coronavirus, pretty soon it's going to be zero. Okay, and then February 28th, when he was in South Carolina, uh, at a at, at speaking at a rally, at a campaign rally, he said that coronavirus was the Democrats' new hoax. Compared that, to, comparing that to what he calls the Russia hoax, the Russian hoax. So it wasn't only it wasn't until two days after the World Health Organization declared coronavirus a global pandemic, which was March 11th. It was Friday the 13th, March 13th, that Trump declared it a national emergency. Two weeks before that, you were saying it was the Democrats' new hoax. And you were downplaying the severity of it. And there were warnings, there were numerous warnings, as, as, as I said before, and I gave you the names of the articles. There was new, numerous warnings in January and February, and he ignored the warnings. Okay? Um, so we look at... Let's see, watch the post. And if you've seen my videos, I dealt with this. Uh, the, the one the, from Sunday night show, uh, March 22nd, the African History Network show. We talked about this. U.S. intelligence reports from January and February warned 
about a likely pandemic. This is March 20th, 2020 uh, from the Washington Post. U.S. intelligence reports from January and February warned about a likely pandemic. Then we look at the uh, New York Times from March 19th, 2020. Before virus outbreak, a cascade of warnings went unheeded. Before virus outbreak, a cascade of warnings went unheeded. Government exercises, including one in 2019, made clear that the U.S. was not ready for a pandemic like the coronavirus. Then we look at the article from January 31st, 2020, from Foreign Policy, foreignpolicy.com, which deals with how Trump sabotaged the U.S. Um, effort to fight um, coronavirus, okay? That's, that's from uh, foreignpolicy.com. We'll try to pull that one up here. I'll give you the link to that one from Foreign Policy. That's an extensive article. OK, um, we look at so what's happened, what's happening is especially after Yamisha Alcindor asked a question March 13th, the African-American female uh, reporter for National Public Radio. And uh, Donald Trump said uh, it was a nasty question. He asked a question about uh, him disbanding the global pandemic team. And their job was to look out for global pandemics and new viruses and things like this, right? So a lot of people started paying attention to that question. So then it was articles written about what was happening and, and the disbanding of the team, the, fi the firing of, uh, the firing of um, scientists, okay? And then other previous articles started resurfacing and people were pointing to previous articles. So I talked about in some of my uh, last broadcasts, past few broadcasts, especially dealing with coronavirus, I talked about the article from May 10th, 2018 from the Washington Post. May 10th, 2018 from the Washington Post. Top White House official in charge of pandemic response exits abruptly. Top White House official in charge of pandemic response exits abruptly. Now this is from May 10th, 2018. The one from foreign policy from January 31st, 2020 ties what happened in May 2018 to what's going on right now. The top White House official responsible for leading the US response in the event of a deadly pandemic has left the administration and the global health security team he oversaw has been disbanded under a reorganization by National Security Advisor John Bolton. This was May 2018. This is what Yamiche Alcindor was asking Trump about. Trump wanted to deflect and defer to other people to ask the, answer the question. He knew exactly what happened because he picked John Bolton to be his National Security Advisor. John Bolton reports to him. So the question we should ask is, who told John Bolton to do this? Who told John Bolton to, this, to, to, to fire Rear Admiral Timothy Zimmer, who headed up the National Security Council Global Health Security Team that studies global pandemics and prevents them and, and, and really prevents them from getting to this point? Who told, who told John Bolton to do that? The abrupt departure of Rear Admiral Timothy Zimmer from the National Security Council means no senior administration official is now focused solely on global health security. Timothy Zimmer's departure along with the breakup of his team comes at, at a time when many experts say the country is already underprepared for the increasing risks of a pandemic or bioterrorism attack. This was May 2018, this article came out. His position was never filled. This is what Yamiche Alcindor was asking. Trump didn't want to deal with the question directly. He wanted to call a question nasty and then deflect to somebody else. Timothy Zimmer's last day was, was Tuesday in, in May of 2018. The same day a new Ebola outbreak was declared in the Congo. He is not being replaced. His position has not been replaced. Pandemic preparedness 
and global health security are issues that require government-wide responses, experts say, as well as the leadership, the leadership of a high-ranking official within the White House who was assigned only to this role. But you gotta have a competent president to realize you need leadership like this. When you have a president who lacks leadership, when you have a president who's incompetent, when you have a president who's a narcissist, when you have a president who thinks everything is about him and, and thinks it's about propping up the stock market, then this is what you get. When you have a president who ignores all the warning signs from the intelligence community, who ignores the warnings from Secretary of Health and Human Services, Alex Azar, going back to January, like January 18th, 2020, who tries to contradict Dr. Anthony Fauci right there at a White House press conference. And Dr. Fauci is, is there looking at this idiot trying to figure out, okay, how do I put this? How do I explain this to the people? Because we're trying to keep people from dying. This is an example of how elections have consequences. This is an example right here of how elections have consequences. All right, let's go back to uh, comments on YouTube. Okay, so we got D.B. Cooper, King of Enigma. Do you think the stock market is going to go down again? Uh, yeah, it will. You'll have some updates, but yeah, it, it, still, it still will. And still the majority of the gains that have been made since February 2017 by the Trump administration in the stock market, the majority of those gains have still been lost. It, it, it came back some in the past couple of days, but still, um, still the majority of those gains uh, have been lost. So we'll see if it, if it recovers. Journal of Jade News. Uh, a lot of people were wondering if people on SSI or um, uh, Social Security dis, uh, Disability would get a check. And the answer is yes. Okay, uh, T. Uh, T. Good Dukes. Trump is doing more harm than good, especially with his attitude. Oh, uh, he's doing more harm than good with his policies. He's doing more harm than good by the he, he declared a war on the scientists for the past three years okay and then we know that uh we've reached uh we've gone uh, over a thousand deaths in the u.s by coronavirus it's um uh, about seven it's about four hundred and seventy thousand cases worldwide i'm pulling up the uh tracking from john hopkins university because they probably have like the, the most accurate tracking now, what's I think important to note is you have over 100,000 people worldwide who have fully recovered from coronavirus as well. So a lot of times that does not get talked about. That's important to note. Uh, Governor Andrew Cuomo of New York has been saying that in the U.S. we need to look at the people who have fully recovered from this. You need more widespread testing and we need to look at the people who have fully recovered because they have developed an antibody. If they recovered from coronavirus, they developed an antibody, okay? And that antibody needs to be studied. But then also those people who fully recovered, those should be people who are allowed to go back to work as well, okay? The, he, 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 he's saying if you have more widespread testing, the people who fully recovered from this should be allowed to go back to work. Uh, let's pull up the tracking from John Hopkins University. Okay, we'll bring that up now. And I was trying to pull up this article from Foreign Policy on the other laptop, but we got a ton of tabs open. Okay, we got Erie Blackface, uh, Walter, Hotel Walter, how are you doing? Warren Captain, Warrior Captain. Is it true that the unemployment benefit will increase by 600? Uh, the unemployment benefit? Uh, I'm not sure. I, I, I'll post a link here to um, the Washington Post. Um, Kennard Farmer, JB. Um, Okay, I think he's commenting on a uh, parent. Yeah, I said earlier, a lot of parents are realizing how uh, important teachers are because a lot of, a lot of parents uh, are not home with their children. 
and they're realizing that their teachers were correct when they talked about how bad the children were. Uh, a lot of people, um, a lot of people realizing how important teachers are and realizing the teachers were correct. All right, let's see here. Let me look at a few more comments. Okay, so John Hopkins University. So we have uh, over 460,000 cases of coronavirus uh, worldwide, uh, 463,000 so far, 69,000 in the US. And then um, as far as deaths in the US, we're over uh, a little over a thousand deaths in the US. Uh, you have you have uh, about a hundred and uh, about one hundred and thirteen thousand cases of people who have totally recovered worldwide from uh, coronavirus, and we're at uh, a little over twenty one thousand deaths worldwide. Also, okay, we got Shalanda. How you doing, Shalanda? Um, she said, teachers are very important, especially the ones that really teach and care. Absolutely, they're underpaid also. Um, let's see here, Warrior, okay. Journal of Jade News, all right. Okay, so, We'll post a link to these articles here. Also, if you like this type of information, you can donate to the African History Network, dollar sign, the AHN show, through Cash App, dollar sign, the AHN show, through Cash App. Then paypal.me forward slash the AHN show through PayPal or at our website, africanhistorynetwork.com. Click on the yellow donate button. Um, African American business owners, email us at customer service at africanhistorynetwork.com. Customer service at africanhistorynetwork.com. And uh, we'll let you know how you can advertise with the African History Network also. Uh, listen to our Sunday night show, the African History Network show, Sundays, 9 p.m. to 11 p.m. Uh, Eastern Standard Time. We do that on 9, 10 a.m. on the Superstation, WFDF. And I'll be uh, uh, broadcasting from this studio uh, the next few weeks because our, our radio station is shut down due to the coronavirus, due to the shutdown from uh, Governor Whitmer until April 13th. So the next, I guess, three Sundays, I'll be doing it from here and uh, calling into the radio station uh, to do my show Sundays, 9 p.m. to 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. All right. So we'll see how all this turns out. Um, yeah. OK, we'll see how all, all this turns out. All right, guys, look, hey, we have to get out of here. Remember, um, at the African History Network, we focus on educating, empowering, and inspiring people of African descent throughout the diaspora and around the world. Because right now, it's correct wrong behavior. What you do for yourself, what you do to yourself, what you allow other people to do to you and get away with is based upon what you think about yourself. Uh, also, I forgot to tell you, uh, so my online courses, uh, we have them all on demand. They're available right now. Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school, ancient Kemet, the Moors and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. That is a, um, it's about 16 hour online course. It's all on demand, watch all around the world. We do a thousand history. I do a PowerPoint presentation. We have articles, book references. We do a history leading up to the transatlantic slave trade. So that's on sale $80 right now, regularly $130. Uh, we'll post a link here, and it's also at our website, africanhistorynetwork.com, africanhistorynetwork.com. Okay, so we have a ton of information. You can uh, use it with your children as well if you like. This is not vulgar. I'm not doing a lot of cursing or things like that. But we give we have book references, articles, video clips, a ton of information that I give you. And we deal with um, history before the transatlantic slave trade. Um, and we deal with thousands of years of history and, and what leads to the transatlantic slave trade taking place. Uh, I deal with the history of the Moors, 
because you have to understand the history of the Moors uh, in the 800 year occupation of Europe by the Africans known as the Moors, which in the teachings they take from Africa, especially the Nile Valley region of Africa, the teachings they take into Europe are going to bring Europe out of the dark ages. And um, we're going to see what leads to the transatlantic slave trade happening. And then we deal with Christopher Columbus who really spreads uh, the transatlantic slave trade with uh, his four voyages and the territory that he conquers, you know, Cuba, Jamaica, Haiti, Puerto Rico, things like this. This increases the need for slave labor, okay? So we deal with how all of this, um, we deal with how all of this uh, evolves, all right? Do we add the $1,200 on next year's income taxes? Now, I'm not sure about that. See, one, one thing I haven't seen, uh, Rosemary answers this question, one thing I haven't seen is, um, do you have to pay taxes on this $1,200 that we're getting? Do we have to pay taxes? Is it tax exempt? We may, we may have to we have we may have to claim it on on next year's taxes, but it's tax exempt. I haven't seen anything saying, do we pay taxes on this twelve hundred dollars? Um, kind of defeat the purpose if we did have to pay taxes on it. Okay, <laughs> hopefully we don't. All right, kind of defeats the purpose if we did. <laughs> so, but once again, this is a, a summary of it. The bill still has to pass the House of Representatives, keep that in mind. And this bill is almost 900 pages. So as more details come out, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll give you an update on, uh, as more details come out, we'll give you an update on, on what's uh, taking place, all right? All right, so you can uh, register for my uh, online course. You can use that with your children uh, also. Uh, we have it on sale, it's uh, $80, regularly $130. It's all on demand, go at your own pace. You're gonna learn a ton of information uh, we do a thousand years of history. We do an ancient Africa also. All right. All right. So look, hey, we have to get out of here. Remember at the African History Network, we focus on educating, empowering, and inspiring people of African descent throughout the diaspora because, um, because right now it's correct wrong behavior. It's not over till we win. We're kind of forever. Uh, we'll talk to you next time and subscribe to our YouTube channel, Michael M. Hotep, I-M-H-O-T-E-P. Turn on notifications so you know when I go live. And um, sign up for our email newsletter. Text the word Kemet, K-E-M-E-T, to 22828 to sign up for our email newsletter. You can also sign up at our uh, website, africanhistorynetwork.com, and follow me on my Facebook fan page, The African History Network, The African History Network. Follow me there um, and uh, turn on notifications so you know when we go live, all right? All right, talk to you all later. Peace. All right, guys, take care.